Um, so let's get started. Welcome. Uh, I'm Mark Richardson. I'm a trustee for the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinars, or webinar, Ground Covers Ecological Solutions in Place of Mulch, uh, which is part of the Focus on Sustainability webinar series. This series was developed by a group of organizations known regionally for their quality edu or ecological education. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, LA. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you all. Um, um, so this is this is a lecture that is kind of near and dear to my heart for a variety of different reasons, and I'm mostly just going to kind of get into them as we go. Um, you should all be seeing a cover screen at this point. Um, I, I was speaking to uh, one of our, our ELA organizers, um, Penny, who many of you probably know, and, and talking about um, pretty much we were we were talking about your what would you call it? I guess the traditional mow and blow versions of landscaping. I mean, um, think about, I'm sure you all probably are familiar with this, but imagine you're driving around and you see um, the, the houses, the apartments, the whatever, where obviously it's not a gardener living there. They pay someone to do it and it's your standard horticulture, um, which is mostly a whole heck of a lot of mulch and a lot of shrubs pruned into meatballs. Um, and we were joking about how this, uh, this idea needs to kind of go away or at least get um, kind of changed a little bit. And it spurred this whole lecture. Um, so I want to get right into this. Um, so this is what I'm talking about when I say that kind of standard horticulture, if you could call it that. Um, you know, for lack of a, a better word, this is, this is gardening done by someone who may not be a gardener or was paying someone else to do a gardener, or maybe just gardening based on what they think is right, based on what they're seeing all over the place. You see this all over the place. Um, no matter where I'm looking, you see varying different degrees of this sort of horticulture where you've got pretty much mulch um, with a couple plants mixed in, um, preferably kind of pruned into meatballs, rocket ships, you know, squares, edges, straight lines. It could also be something a bit more like this though. This is kind of the other end of the spectrum. And this is, um, the, the general idea is that if you're not doing this, you're doing really intensive landscaping, something difficult. Um, this is by no means difficult. This is easy, simple landscaping, but very effective. Um, this is Garden in the Woods. Uh, this is where I work. This is not easy or simple landscaping, but the idea is still there where we're not really trying to focus on mulch. We're instead trying to focus on everything else. Um, this is another one of our spots. This is Garden in the Woods again. And what I really like about this image is if you look at this, this is the spring after a fall planting for us. So this is a very young garden. Um, this is pretty much the first growing season it's had to be able to kind of get started. It's not mature yet. In fact, there's a lot more we've done since this picture was taken. I, I wish I had the picture of this from this spring versus uh, this image, which I think is probably uh, two years old at this point. And the idea is kind of, you know, you decide which one would you rather have. Um, and there's a variety of different reasons why you might chose the left side over the right side. And it's not just about aesthetics, although I think it's pretty easy to argue that the left side, at least in my opinion, looks better. Um, you know, one of the questions I like to kind of point out to people is, is how many of you got into gardening, landscaping, whatever, for a love of mulch? Um, I've, I've not yet met anyone who's actually raised their hand to that question. Not that I could see your hands up now anyway. Um, but we've got this odd obsession with this product um, that we use a lot of in the landscape, and, and we're not necessarily sure why. Um, there are good reasons to use mulch. We'll get into them in a second. Um, but there's also good reasons to start thinking of it in a different way. So this is what I think of as kind of your typical New England woodland. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different types of you know woodlands in New England, but this is kind of the standard that I see in my area, at least. Um, you got oaks and um, pines up above. You tend to see a lot of, this is obviously an acidic forest, so we've got blueberries, we've got huckleberries, wintergreen, that's a Virginia creeper. Um, the idea here is that a, a woodland um, or a meadow or an effective garden or whatever landscape we might be talking about has kind of these various different plants that play various different roles within it. Um, and what you've got here in this natural setting that's been kind of brought down to this one little slide here is that every Every piece of the puzzle is filled. Every niche is filled. Um, nature is not a big fan of vacuums. It doesn't like empty spaces. And when there are empty spaces, it tends to fill them in. Um, and depending on your point of view and what you're looking at and what was filled in, you might call those, those fillers plants, or you might call them you know, freebies and good guys. 
But imagine taking this, and now we're kind of bringing it into, say, a garden sort of setting. You know, we've got this woodland, we're turning it into a garden or at least a landscape property or something somewhere in between completely natural and very human, you know, involved. Oh, come on, computer. There we go. Um, and the idea here is that if we wanted to, say, turn this into a woodland garden instead of just a natural woodland, what we wouldn't be doing is going in there and just removing things altogether. If you completely remove things and don't fill them back in, then, then you get various other things kind of coming in to take the place. The idea here is that we still hold all these niches filled. Maybe we remove some of the hay scented fern and brought in some broad beech fern. Um, we've taken out a couple of the pine trees, replaced them in hickories, because we really like hickories. And then uh, Flux and Tiarella, you know, two of our, I think you guys should be able to see my mouse, so these two right here. Um, those are, it's one of my favorite kind of ground cover combinations. They're down in the bottom right here. We've got Chrysogon and Virginianum, green and gold. Um, you know, right there, those past three are three good ground covers. Um, and the idea here is that we haven't left anything empty. We may have pulled out some things and, you know, replaced them with others, but everything that we removed has been replaced with something else instead of simply removed and left alone. So a lot of times in the landscape, um, we, we have holes in the landscape. We have, you know, these vacuums and they need to be filled in and, and we're told to use mulch. And there's, there's good reasons for that. Mulch does have quite a, a few benefits to it. Um, if you've got a, you know, a, an empty site, brand new, you're not, you know, nothing's been planted yet. Mulch is quite, you know, it, it helps to control weeds. Um, retaining moisture most definitely. If you've got a, you know, an open soil versus a covered soil, you know, you're, you're gonna lose a lot more moisture out of an unmulched bed. Um, preventing soil erosion, at least to some extent. You know, if, if you've got a real raging stream side, I don't think it's going to do the trick, but it's a whole lot better than nothing. It helps to maintain soil nutrients. That can really vary greatly depending on, um, you know, the, the, the mulch being used in the conditions and maintaining soil temperature, same sort of story. Um, the idea here is that every single one of those things that we might be doing with mulch, plants can do better. Um, you know, imagine a big open bed of soil, nothing on it. Um, you leave that soil open all season long. By the end of the season, it is full of weeds. Um, you know, weed seeds land, they, they start growing, the big ones really take on, the, you know, everything starts moving quickly. Um, take that bed and fill it with mulch, and by the end of the season, it's still going to be full of weeds. Definitely less weeds than if you left it completely open, but anyone who's put down mulch knows that it is not a solution to weeds. Um, it helps. It's a part of the solution. That being said, take that bed and fill it up with plants, and the amount of weeds that grow in between those plants, once they get established, is much, much less. Um, plants are also better at retaining moisture in the ground. They shade the soil much more effectively than mulch does once they've filled in. Um, roots are the best way to prevent soil erosion. Mulch is good. Roots are a whole lot better. Um, and once you get a whole plant system going, there's there's a whole bunch of different exchanges going on on the chemical level between the plants, their roots, the soil, the, the biology of the soil, and the various different minerals. And maintaining soil nutrients works a lot more effectively when you've got living plants in place. Same story with soil moist, uh, soil temperature. The running idea here is that of everything that mulch does, an established bed of plants does better. There's also problems with mulch, um, and this is something that tends to come about when you've got, you know, mulch used in most cases incorrectly. Um, you know, anaerobic conditions, um, which can lead to crown rot of trees. I mean, this bottom right corner here, you see the, the classic mulch volcano, which is really kind of the worst idea we've ever come up with as far as mulch in, in typical garden settings. Um, depending on what, what sort of um, mulch you're using, impermeable surfaces um, can really be an issue, um, and especially if you've got, you know, kind of crappy mulch, which is usually pretty much ground up pallets and a whole lot of dye, you can get things like wood alcohol syndrome, toxic additives, um, and all sorts of other problems that most, once again, the plants don't have. Um, you don't get anaerobic conditions because of plants. In fact, they're quite good at, at turning that around. Um, getting roots into the soil, getting all the life forms that come with those roots tends to really solve a lot of these problems. Um, if you've got toxic additives in your soil, there's a lot of plants that you can use to break down those additives and make your soil clean again. Um, the plants are simply better. So the idea is to start thinking about all this mulch in the landscape and decide what plants what might we be able to use that could actually do this better. Um, and which ones can we use in a way where we're not creating maintenance nightmares or, or trading one problem for another. The idea that we can just simply replace mulch with plants, well, you need to kind of pare it out a little bit more than that. It's a good starting point, but it's not the answer right there. 
So I want to talk about a variety of different plants today, and I broke them down into some categories that we can really kind of um, get into instead of just going A through Z. Um, starting with the sun, we've got um, a couple different ground cover species that I really like in sunny environments. Um, we'll get into some, some bigger ones later that I think also work well. Just, just so you all know, this whole kind of ground covers in place of mulch, I've taken ground covers with a, uh, well, we're broadening it quite a bit. Um, plants for the shade, I'm going to have a whole section called in between every stone. And what I'm talking about there are literally the cracks in rocks, the areas in between the paving stones, um, those little spaces. I want to talk about a better lawn because um, in many cases turf grasses are ground covers that's that's you know our lawn is we tend to want a ground cover sort of lawn um, and to think that it all has to be Kentucky bluegrass is, is simply not true there's a variety of different things we can use um, a section that I'm going to call throw down seed and walk away it's literally what it sounds like um, you've got some bare soil throw down seed add water and walk away and see what happens um, there's some plants that work quite well that way there's a lot of plants that don't so you definitely got to pick your right ones and treat them correctly um, and finally, to end it off, we're going to talk about the woody cover. Um, uh, a number of plants, um, mostly when we're talking about ground covers and these other kind of categories here, we're talking about herbaceous species. Um, but there are some woody species that can act in a very similar manner. So let's jump right into plants themselves, because that's really what I want to talk about here. Starting with the sun. Um, there are, there's a genus of, of plants called Antenaria. They're the pussy toes. Um, and there's a variety of different species in New England, um, south of us, west of us, that, that do a variety of different things. And in general, Antenaria are um, slow growing species. Um, well behaved is a way that I've heard them described a number of times. They tend to be pretty small and, and, and they don't move all that quickly. Um, Antenaria platagenifolia is kind of the thug of the group, although I, I don't think you could really call this one a thug, but it definitely moves a whole heck of a lot faster from species like Antenaria neglecta or Parliniae or some of the others. This has got a larger leaf than most of the other Antenaria species. In fact, it's got the largest leaf of any of them I know. Um, blooms quite nice in spring, although it's not something to, to show you this huge, you know, hibiscus pink flower. Um, it's gonna show you this small um, kind of puffy white flower that's if anything more textural than not. The real um, people that tend to know this one well are the butterfly enthusiasts. This is the preferred host species for the American lady butterfly. Um, it's a wonderful species, and, and we see this one at Garden in the Woods pretty much every year. Um, this is a, a plant where if you go kind of looking around on the leaves in the early season, you'll sometimes see little bits of webbing, and you'll eventually, if you're looking closely, find these little caterpillars that start off looking almost just like a kind of dark brown and white striped caterpillar, and then mature into the caterpillar you see here. If you simply leave it alone, the plant will eventually get some webbing, some kind of eaten on it. It doesn't look all that nice, but it doesn't tend to get all that bad either. Um, it gets kind of minor, you know, minor damage, I think would be the best way to put it. Um, and if you wait about a week, um, all of a sudden these kind of the, the damages that you were looking at tend to just stop. Um, another two weeks later and the plant has overgrown anything and you can't even tell anything had happened and about a week later than that you see these butterflies flying around. The great thing about our native plants and our native insects is they've, they've come to a pretty good balance. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the you know a good a good parasite doesn't kill its hosts idea. Um, the idea here is that these these insects eat but they don't kind of eat um, un, unintentionally or they, they eat with the point where the plant can then survive this reproduce further, more insects, more plants, and everything comes into balance. Um, so that you get a good kind of mixture of both going on. We're gonna talk about a bunch of different species here um, where you're gonna see a little bit of damage on one leaf. And if you kind of step back for a quick second and look at the plant overall, you don't notice it. Um, but when you go looking for it, you could find the signs of life that are associated with a lot of these different plants. This one is probably one of my favorite species. Um, I, I cannot get enough of this one. This is Arctostaphylus uberursii. It's called bearberry. Literally translates to berry of the bear. And if you look in this picture here, this, uh, there he is, that guy right in there, that's a bee inside of this um, flower. What you've got here is a member of the heath family and they've got these buzz pollinated flowers that are really well um, pollinated by our native bees and they're not so well pollinated by the honeybees. Um, our native bees have this ability to pretty much dislocate their um, wing muscles from their actual wings and then vibrate and it allows all the pollen to just pour out on them works quite well. This is a species that blooms in the spring um, although honestly I don't think too many people are planting it for its flowers. The flowers are very nice in this picture but they're small they're not super noticeable. Um, most people do plant it for its foliage and for these summer berries. 
Um, as I said, bury of the bear. And, and no, it's not going to attract bears to your landscape, but if the bears are around, then they will most certainly eat these berries. This plant, um, as well as the previous one, are tolerant of extremely sunny, extremely dry conditions. It grows pretty much in sand dunes. Um, these are both good species for hell strips, um, for those tough, tough areas, you know, in between the kind of sidewalk and the roadside, or that front bed out, you know, in, the, in front of the house where things are just really, really sandy and the, the landscape company came in and took away all your topsoil, tried to sell it back to you. You got angry and said, I don't need it. And you realized you got sand to work with. These are great species for those environments. It's also got some amazing fall color. Um, give it full sun and you get a nice bright red like this. Um, and this plant really likes full sun when it can get it. Little bit of shade, what I call part sun instead of, you know, shady, and you get more of a burgundy hue out of it, which is really quite nice as well. That being said, if this plant gets too much shade, then it starts to really get thin and it's just, there's better options for shade. Um, in fact, there's a lot of good options for shade. We're going to get into those pretty much right now. Um, I find that in many kind of sunny conditions, I tend to think of as a lot of uh, clumping grasses as my kind of cover for spaces. Um, for the shade, on the other hand, I really get heavy into these ground covers. So we're going to see quite a few more ground covers for the shade section. Um, this is a species that we talk about quite regularly these days. It's it's become one of our favorites. Um, it was um, Waldstinia phragoroides. They've gone and renamed it. The taxonomists seem to have gotten frisky lately. Um, this is GM phragoides now, barren strawberry. This is a species, it's not actually a strawberry, but it's got a similar looking leaf. Um, the flower is somewhat similar, but as you can see, uh, yellow instead of the typical white. Um, this blooms in the spring and blooms um, quite nicely. It's not a heavy, heavy bloomer like the next couple of plants, but it definitely shows off when it's in flower. It blooms at a time that makes it very easy to work with because it blooms, um, it, it, the flowers overlap with a lot of the flock species. It overlaps with Tiorella, it overlaps with the Trillium, and then a variety of other kind of woodland species. And so it's very easy to kind of get good color combinations going with this one. It can also form a nice thick mass. This is one that can kind of go either way as far as like a pure cover on its own, really filling in and really, you know, being on its own without needing anything else to kind of um, accent it. On the other hand, you can also plant this one in a thinner spot and start mixing it with other species like you see here where it's mixed in with this, what looks like probably Flux um, stolonifera. Chrysogonum virginianum is one that I feel like uh, used to be very popular and seems to have kind of gone out of style. Um, this one is, is called green and gold, um, sometimes also called golden star. I'm kind of the PR guy, I'm trying to bring it back here. Um, this is another species that blooms heavily in spring, um, like the previous one. The thing with this, unlike the, the previous one, this one sporadically will rebloom throughout the season afterwards. Not in a way that, you know, that really puts on a show. You know, don't expect great things on this in the middle of summer and fall. Um, that being said, once you get enough of these into the ground, you'll find that you've got flowers on it pretty much all season, um, in, you know, in small amounts. And this means that right now at Garden in the Woods, there are flowers on this plant um, and they're going to get frozen in time for the winter. And come March, when things start finally kind of melting out a little bit, we're going to see this sad, bedraggled little yellow flower that went all through the winter. And no, it doesn't look very nice. Um, but that being said, what it does do is it makes us smile. Every time we go by this, we think, wow, that flower went right through the entire winter. And it's just, you know, what else could you ask for for a plant that makes you smile? This one is another one that also overlaps quite nicely, especially with the flocks. You can find a lot of pinks and blues. They, they work really well with these yellow flowers from a design point of view. So having these overlapping bloom times is really quite helpful. Um, this one spreads reasonably quickly, um, faster than the Waldstinia, slower than, say, Phlox solanifera, which we'll get to in another couple of slides. It's kind of the perfect uh, you know, rate. It's, it's not too quick. It's not too slow. What I like to do with this one is I recommend this one to anyone who, you know, kind of is part of a garden club looking for plants to pass around or has gardening friends or wants a good cheap way to add a lot of ground covers to the landscape. What you're looking at here is a picture of this plant um, in my stock beds where I grow this one for production purposes. Um, and the nice thing about this one is absolutely anybody can propagate this species. There is no need for any real talents or a greenhouse or any good conditions. Um, this is, you know, plants, young plants, and what I'm looking for here is you can see there's my hori hori, the garden knife, kind of digging in right around the edge here. And what you start doing is you start lifting up the edge. 
Um, and you'll see that there's going to be this small root starting to form. And on this picture here, if you look, um, where's my mouse? Back here, if you're cutting in early June, it's going to look like just this white little nub here. If you're cutting more like July, you'll see something more like this where you've actually got a root coming in. But as you can see, these roots start forming right kind of down as the ground, as the uh, soil touches this stem. Um, and if you pull that back a little bit, you can cut and you can cut behind the node so you've got a couple roots started. Um, these roots go into, you know, kind of the, into your greenhouse, into your home, into wherever. And you're just looking to cut off a couple leaves so that you've got just a couple leaves left on top. Um, what you don't want is if you've got 30 leaves and pretty much no root system, things dry out very quickly. So you reduce your leaves a little bit, stick this thing directly into a pot. No need for a cutting tray, no need for root hormone, no need for anything else other than that. Um, and about a month later, you've got a pot that has got roots coming out of the bottom. Um, plant is ready to go. Um, these are quick moving in, in containers. They're very easy to do. Um, if you want to just kind of move them around your garden, you can just stick a shovel in the middle and kind of tear them to pieces. But if you want to really start quickly increasing your numbers, a small patch can easily give you 50 cuttings. Um, this is something where you can quickly start building up your numbers nicely. This is a plant that I've always felt like I'm, I'm trying to kind of convince everyone that it's not a, a voracious weed. Um, this is Canada Mayflower. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this thing before. It is a very common plant in New England. Pretty much if you're looking at pine trees up above you, you're looking at Canada Mayflower underneath you. Um, the flowers are not nearly as big as the picture makes them seem. They're, they're maybe an inch tall. Um, and this thing does grow quite quickly. Um, this is how it looks in the woods. Um, the nice thing about this one, though, is if you start kind of thinking to bring it into the landscape a little bit, give it a little bit of soil, a little bit of moisture, a little bit more kind of light, um, you can get a really nice thick patch of this stuff that blooms consistently and looks really quite attractive. The thing about this one, though, is as a very, very fast grower, um, when you start putting it in, you think, oh, geez, you know, this thing is just going to take over my garden. I don't want this near the crazy native plant. I told me to plant it, and now I've got a maintenance nightmare in front of me. Um, but the good thing about this one is despite being very fast, it is extremely shallow rooted. The roots don't go down much more than about a quarter inch, half inch at most. So if this plant is used in conjunction with a larger clumping species, like your basic Solomon seal, false Solomon seal, lacteas, most of your clumping ferns, pretty much any woodland plant other than maybe partridge berry or bunch berry, this thing spreads quickly around them, but it doesn't push right through them. It doesn't stop other species from growing. Instead, it just acts as a living mulch. Um, fills in quickly, covers the area for you, looks quite nice when brought into garden settings, but doesn't stop other things at all. Um, it's one that we use somewhat regularly when we just need a good cover for an area um, and we, we know that the plants that are getting planted around it are good kind of clumping perennial species that can handle the fact that this thing's moving all around them. If you ever want to plant something new in it, just tear a hole out of the middle of it, plant your new plant, add some water, and this thing will fill right back in. Very, very easy to work with. Um, and despite its speed, it's not a thug when planted correctly with other good species. All right, I've already mentioned phlox a couple different times. We'd better cover it. Um, there's three different species that are commonly used in um, New England gardens. This one is probably my favorite. Um, this is phlox de vericata. This is the one that's usually just referred to as woodland phlox. Um, what I really like about this one, first off, it's the one that is kind of the closest to being truly native in New England. It's, it's more common on our landscape from a natural point of view. Um, but my real kind of love of this one is the fragrance that comes with it a wonderful, sweet, soft fragrance in early spring that, that really just kind of, it brightens up the landscape wonderfully. We've got a lot of this one planted in our woodland garden. And when it's in bloom, you're just walking through this kind of beautiful perfumed air. It's, it's, it's really nice. Um, it also blooms at the exact same time as Tiarella cordifolia, a species that I'll get to in another slide or two. Um, and the two together are just fantastic. This is a kind of tried and true combination, um, Phlox and Tiarella. I highly recommend mixing these two together. Throw in a couple, you know, wood poppy ephemerals and a trillium here and there and a couple ferns and you pretty much got a woodland garden ready to go. We pretty much think of these two as the backbone of many woodland landscapes and then all your specimens go in between them. Um, what you're looking at here is mostly phlox and tiarella, but if you start looking closely, you can see some acteas in there. You can see some styloform in there. You can see, well, I think that might be geranium maculatum, but I'm not exactly sure. You get the idea. This guy's Phlox stolonifera. Um, when in bloom, it can look quite a bit like Phlox de Vericata. The nice thing about this one as it compares to de Vericata is the two do bloom about two weeks apart. They overlap though. 
So a lot of the times it's nice to actually mix the two right together because you don't notice that you've got two different species. It just seems like your phlox is blooming for a longer period of time. It makes it quite nice as far as extending that bloom season, especially on a species that can be a little short bloomed at time. Um, this one does tend to stay a little bit lower than Devericata, but you'll see that as, as you can see in the image here, the flowers do pop up. So when it's in bloom, you don't really notice that short in size, but when it's just foliage, this one really creeps along and Devericata does stick up a little bit more. One real advantage that this one's got over Devericata is its tolerance of difficult conditions. Um, if anyone can um, knows Garden in the Woods well, you, you may recognize this image, although it's pretty obscure. Um, this is a, a picture of a rock um, in front of the old Curtis Cottage, and what you're looking at there is a patch of hay-scented fern. Um, for those of you who know hay-scented fern, it's quite a vigorous spreader. It spreads easily as quickly as uh, the Canada Mayflower, but it puts down a much more robust root system. I, you know, it's got its value in certain landscapes, but it's a little more rambunctious than most uh, typical garden settings at least call for. But that green mush underneath the hay-scented fern, those are the leaves of Phlox dolinifera. Um, this is a patch of a plant that has been growing here for many years, got overrun by, um, by hay-scented fern, was left overrun by hay-scented fern for at least the first six years of me being at Garden in the Woods. And when we went in there and cut out the hay-scented fern, the phlox didn't bat an eye. It just kind of filled right back in and started blooming for us that very next season. I don't know too many plants that can grow in amongst a patch of hay-scented fern. That's a pretty darn good plant. Um, and we found that Stolonifera is the most drought tolerant and the most shade tolerant of any of the flock species that we've worked with. Divericata will do, you know, dry soils if, you know, on an occasion and, um, you know, dense shade, it won't do as well, but it'll survive, but it definitely won't perform quite as well as Stolonifera does. Finally, this um, flux, whoop, that should have changed his name, but what we're looking at here is Phlox subulata, the moss flux, um, not Stolonifera, the woodland premium, but Phlox subulata. Um, this is one that's really better in sunny conditions. This could have easily gone in the first part of the lecture, but I wanted to keep the flocks together. Um, this is a species that you see used in masses quite regularly. It can use quite, be quite beautiful, but it's also overused somewhat regularly. Don't overdo it with this species. It definitely has its value, but um, this is just tacky as far as I'm concerned. I've mentioned Tyrell a couple times already. This is foam flower. Um, you can see it here again, um, combined with, uh, with the blue wood phlox. Um, there's some Solomon seal in there. You get the idea. These are our, our backbones with all these other specimens in between. We like stumps. I think they look good in the garden. Um, here it is combined with, um, well, that's mostly actually phlox de vericata there, but combined with Actea rubrifolia. What's not mentioned on this one too often is despite the fact that the flowers are quite nice, it also has some quite attractive foliage. Um, this is not the, the cultivar that many people tend to think it is. There are a variety of different cultivars that look like this, but we find that when you start growing this species from seed, you get amazing variation in the leaf forms um, to ones that are very, very kind of um, heavily lobed, to ones that are much less lobed, some that are shiny, some that have varying degrees of variegation on them. And they can even look quite nice in fall and, and kind of going into winter with these rich colors coming out. As much as I think, you know, no one's planting Tiarella for its foliage aspects, we tend to think of it more for the flower, but don't forget that this plant has a lot more to offer than simply the flower. The foliage is quite nice as well. All right, um, in between every stone, this is something that you see in the White Mountains where I took this picture, but it's also something that you can, you know, take clues from the landscape when it comes to what you're looking at in your own kind of home landscape. Um, I see this in the whites and I think it's great and I think, you know, I've got some paving stones with little bits of, you know, nothing in between them. And I've got rocks that I use to line my pathways and there's a little space in between them with nothing in it. And there's all these little places where I might want to do something like this if only I could. This is my favorite one by far. Um, Houstonia cerulea. These are the bluets, um, sometimes called Quaker ladies. Um, this is an absolutely wonderful species that there's a good chance you've already got on your landscape. Um, the best way to find them is to simply not mow your um, lawn in the spring. Wait till about, you know, kind of May and you'll start seeing lots of white flowers appearing in the lawn. Not a guarantee on every lawn, but it's a pretty common occurrence. Um, and that's this one. And then once you find them, you can kind of flag them, move them to another area. Um, this is a pretty common plant in New England if you know where to look, but a lot of times it's, it's overlooked because where it likes to grow is places where we tend to... Uh, either mow it down or, or overplant it with larger things. Um, this is a small plant. The pictures here make it look larger than it is, but it probably only grows about two, three inches tall. Um, the foliage underneath those flowering stems is, is no more than about a half inch at the most. Um, what's great about it though, 
is um, once it's in bloom, and you can see here actually growing in a rock wall where we planted it over at Garden in the Woods, once it's in bloom, you want to start looking out for um, these guys. These are the fruits of it. In fact, these are the past fruits of it. Um, when it first starts, they're just little green balls, and you'll see a little crack start forming on them. And if you go and crack those things open and kind of pour it out, you'll find these little seeds inside that look like poppy seeds. Um, collect these seeds. This is, you know, it's, it's in fruit for probably about a two to three week period where it's fruiting heavily and you can start grabbing these seeds and you can simply sprinkle these in between those cracks and rocks um, or do as Rick Dark does and then plant out your, you know, your paving stone um, patio or your walkway. And instead of trying to get those stones as close as possible to stop plants from growing in between them, spread them out to about, you know, half inch, maybe an inch and sow a whole bunch of seed in between them. Plants like this, Houstonia cerulea, 22 days after sowing and we've got germination starting and oftentimes what i'll do is i'll actually just fill up plug trays with soil nothing in it um and then sow you know three to five to maybe eight seeds of this species in each one of those cells um and i've got plugs starting to um, form and within a matter of a couple of weeks i've got a plug ready to go um if i sow in spring then these plugs are ready by the mid to later summer from there you can either pop them up or more commonly just plant them out on the landscape or give them to friends um, this is a very easy one to move around um, in garden settings we usually just direct sow it a lot of times what we find ourselves doing is planting it at the top of say a set of stone steps or at the top of an area where we're going to just let that seed naturally disperse kind of downhill work with your land a little bit um, and this plant will move on its own quite nicely and you can kind of help it along as much as possible. But imagine, you know, a walkway filled with this in between every single step. It's absolutely beautiful. Sedum ternatum is another one you can treat in the same way, except instead of collecting seed, what you're going to do is just kind of grab those little leaves. Um, this grows like many other sedum, but, but unlike the other sedum, instead of growing in sunny, dry conditions, this is the woodland stone crop. Um, this one likes a little bit more moisture, a little bit more shade. It'll grow in full sun, but only in moist sites, and it tends to be happiest in kind of shadier spots. Um, we actually sometimes interplant this with more vigorous kind of ground covers, like mayapple, for example. This thing will just kind of hang out underneath the mayapples, not really doing anything until the midsummer when the mayapples start to go dormant, and then all of a sudden this plant will kind of take the space for the rest of the summer. Um, works quite well. Looks great on its own is the kind of front of the garden where it just kind of forms a nice thick mat. Um, and when you get up close, you notice that the, the texture on this is your kind of classic sedum texture that I find very attractive, um, a very usable plant. And when I want to kind of spread this one around, it's as simple as most of the other sedums. Just grab one of these kind of, you know, chunks of leaves, pull it out. If you get a little roots with it, great. If not, who cares? Um, either stick it into a pot and let it root in there or stick it just directly into the soil in a new place. Add a little bit of moisture, don't let it dry out, and you've got a new plant growing. Um, very easy to move around, a good way to kind of put this into small spaces. It's pretty hard to plant established plants in these little cracks and rocks. So being able to just stick some seeds or stick some cuttings in, all of a sudden you can start planting out areas that you hadn't thought you could really handle before. So of all the opposites, this is the classic White Mountains plant. This is three-tooth sink foil. In fact, this is the plant that you find growing in the cracks of rocks, pretty much all up and down the White Mountains. Um, this plant will handle full sun, extremely dry soils. This is, it'll grow in a half inch of soil at the most. In fact, this is the, the cover image of this, you know, first part of this section. This part here is not um, a garden. This is, if I remember correctly, I think I took this on Mount Madnock. Um, and what you'll find is that, you know, when, when one of these gets established and the water starts running down these cracks of rocks, it just moves the plant down with it, whether it be by a seed or the plant spreading, you know, kind of rhizomatically. And these cracks just get filled in with this wonderful plant. Um, and this is something that can be done in the landscape readily. Um, this is not a plant for woodland gardens or good moist soils, but if you've got sunny dry sites and you need a good ground cover, this is a great choice. It blooms in the spring. Um, it's got a wonderful evergreen foliage that is shiny right through the season. And given good sunlight, you can get some really nice fall colors out of this one that will last right into the winter if they don't get covered over by snow. It's kind of the running joke, you know, yes, it's an evergreen, but if we get an inch of snow, it's white just like everything else. All right, let's get into lawns a little bit. We've got this strange idea that lawns are somehow low maintenance, um, which I don't really understand. The amount of work that goes into keeping these sorts of things looking like this is immense. 
Um, you know, the regular mowing, the regular inputs, the constant need to water these things and fertilize these things to get them to grow. And then God forbid they actually start growing. We got to break out the mowers and cut them back down to size again. Um, it never really makes a lot of sense to me. So I want something different. Um, in my perfect world, my lawn is going to require no supplemental watering at all. I'm perfectly fine with watering for establishment. I think that's a, a necessary thing that should be done in every case. Um, but once a plant's established, I don't want to have to water it again. If I need to water it again, I'll find a better plant. I don't want to have to fertilize this or anything for that matter. Um, I see nothing wrong with fertilizer in nursery settings, um, you know, where you're working with soilless medium and so forth. But in the landscape, don't see any need for fertilizer whatsoever. Um, compost can do anything fertilizer can. And honestly, we pretty much stopped using compost at Garden in the Woods just because we use good mulch, um, treat our plants well. And the plants create their own energy. That's kind of the amazing thing about plants. They don't need the hamburger the way they, we do. They just need sunlight and moisture, and they can do it themselves. Pick the right plant for the right place, and you don't even need to be adding compost. Require no pesticides or herbicides. This goes kind of without doubt for us. We are, you know, everything we do is all about kind of sustainable, ecological landscapes. We're trying to attract pollinators to our plants. The last thing we want to be doing is poisoning them when they get there. So with that in mind, not only do we not want to poison them, but we want to feed them. That's, you know, an important thing of what we're doing on the landscape. I am constantly hungry, so it's nice when plants feed me as well. And if it's going to be a lawn, it needs to be able to tolerate foot traffic. This is the reason why you can't use antenaria for your lawn. You can't use flocks. You can't use pretty much anything we've covered so far. Um, if it's the occasional step, okay, no big deal. Um, but if we're talking about a space that I need to be able to walk over every day to go check my mail or to get to my car or whatever, we need something that can handle some more foot traffic. And the problem with typical lawns is that they're full of this crap. Um, these are the 30 commonly used lawn pesticides. And notice the very top one that's got all of these health effects, 2,4-D, that's the most commonly used um, of any of these. This is reasons for me to change my ideas of lawns. Um, Oftentimes when I ask people, you know, why they need to keep their lawn, they tell me their kids play on them or their dog needs a place to run. And then you look at this list and you wonder why they're letting their kids on the lawn. Um, we have better options. There are things that actually work better. What if your lawn could look like this without any of the inputs I just mentioned? Um, this is the same plan in both cases, unmowed on the left, mowed on the right. Um, what you're looking at here is not Kentucky bluegrass, which, by the way, is not from Kentucky. Um, this is Carex Pennsylvanica. It's our native Pennsylvania sedge. This is a great native species. And not only is it a great species from this kind of aesthetical value, but what we don't tend to think about is the value of leaves when it comes to pollinators. We think about flowers. We think about the monarch butterfly visiting the, you know, the, the, the bee balm or the echinacea or the milkweed. Um, but when it comes down to it, the monarch butterfly can feed on any one of those things. The monarch caterpillar is the one that must have the milkweed. Um, and the reason for that is because the caterpillars eat the leaves. And when you start thinking about that, you start realizing that a plant doesn't necessarily need to bloom to have value from a pollinator point of view. This carex feeds more pollinators than milkweed does. Um, it feeds more pollinators than Joe Pieweed does. It feeds more pollinators than bee balm. Um, this is an immensely valuable plant, and it's because we got little caterpillars eating those leaves. It does bloom in the spring. I wouldn't go so far as to call it a really beautiful flower, but I'll take anything over nothing. Um, I find these flowers intricate and interesting. And, you know, for five minutes while they're out there, I'm going to enjoy them. Um, that being said, I'm looking at this more as a lawn. Um, as I said here, same um, plant on both sides, unmowed on the left, mowed on the right. And it's kind of your choice as to whether or not you want to mow this. Um, you don't need to mow this. In fact, the, the size you see on the left is as big as it'll ever get. There it is, unmowed, completely unmowed, never mowed right there for years on end. Um, you have the choice though. You can mow it if you want to keep it short, um, in which case you need to mow it once a year, maybe twice. Um, we tend to mow ours in the midsummer before we have events on it so people feel more comfortable coming around and walking on top of it. Um, if we don't mow it at all, then we think to mow it maybe once every two or three years just to keep the tree seedlings out because we're trying to keep this lawn aesthetic going here. Um, this is as tall as it ever gets. And if you like that kind of lush look, you don't need to mow at all. It also works well in garden settings. It doesn't necessarily need to be a lawn. Um, here you've got, you know, uh, Dicentra eximia in the front and behind. Um, next to it is, well, you can't see it in the picture, but there's some sassafras nearby and a couple of rhododendron. Um, this is a plant where it can come into the garden as well as being this kind of lawn alternative. Though honestly, it's not my favorite lawn alternative. Um, my personal favorite is this one right here. 
This is Fregaria virginiana, the wild strawberry. Um, this is a fast spreading species, fast enough where I wouldn't recommend using it in mixed settings amongst other plants the way you can with that previous Carex pensilvanica. This one is going to quickly fill in cover areas quite nicely. Um, it's a trait that works very well when we're looking to cover an entire lawn area. Um, blooms in spring, flowers that are most certainly loved by the bees. Um, berries in the midsummer, perfectly edible. On a good season where, where you know, you've got good moisture going down and it's not terrible drought like was this picture here when I took in 2016, these berries are wonderfully flavored. They're tart, but they're definitely very sweet as well, and you get this wonderful combination of flavors. In a really, really dry, difficult season, it's still blue. It's still fruits. Um, more so than I find on any cultivated strawberry, unless you're really taking care of it. And though the berries are much more tart that year, um, they still make a fabulous jam, and personally, I like eating them regardless. And this is it as a lawn. Um, this can most certainly be a lawn. It doesn't look like a typical lawn, um, but as you can see here, left unmowed, it doesn't get any more than about four, maybe four and a half inches tall. Um, if you want to keep it shorter, again, you can mow this one. Um, we tend to mow it again ahead of our events um, because we want people to feel comfortable getting out, walking on top of it, sitting down on top of it. Um, we have an event called Plants and Pints, which is pretty much our mid-season, um, well, it's, it's a plant, it's a celebration of all things native plants and beer pretty much. Um, we have a local brewery come in, they tend to brew up a batch with some sort of native species. In the past they used uh, staghorn sumac. We're gonna be using our native hops in the future. This year we're thinking about tapping our native uh, sweet birch trees and making a, a spring um, birch hop beer. But what you see here is this can work effectively as a lawn. And the nice thing about this is it does not need fertilizer. It doesn't need mowing, it doesn't need watering. Um, and this plant feeds more pollinators than any other herbaceous species in New England with the exception of goldenrods and asters. This plant is more valuable than the bee bombs, than the jopai weeds, than the eupatoriums, than the baptisia, than the, the, the lupins, pretty much you name all of them, this one is better than all of those, um, in most cases combined. This species here supports, um, we're guessing somewhere around 72 different native um, caterpillars in New England. Compare that to bee bomb, which is still a very good pollinator plant, that one supports about eight. And again, like the chrysogonum that I mentioned earlier, this is one of the easiest plants in the world to propagate. You go up to the edge of the patch or right into the middle of it and you're gonna find these stolons running around with little plants just starting. Um, stick a hori hori underneath it, dig it up, cut off that stolon, you've got that little thing ready to go, put it in a pot and uh, you know a month later, you've got a pot ready to go, sending out stolons looking for a new area. Um, it makes it really good for replacing your typical lawns with. Instead of looking at that huge lawn and thinking, how am I possibly gonna do all of this? Do a four foot square of it with wild strawberries. And once that four foot square is filled, then go dig another four foot square. But instead of buying new wild strawberries, just tear a couple chunks out of that established patch and move them over. Um, and start attacking it a piece at a time it becomes much more doable. You don't have to worry about trying to get the entire lawn in one big swoop. For those of you who like the idea of a perennial, low maintenance, um, native, edible um, strawberry, but don't really want to kill your entire lawn and replace it with that, and you're looking for something to plant in amongst other species, Fregaria vesca, our woodland wild strawberry, could possibly be renamed the clumping strawberry. Um, this one does not stand out stolons, or when it does, it's extremely, uh, you know, it's much less common and much less rambunctious. Definitely usable in more of a mixed setting. Um, not a very good choice for a lawn replacement, but a better choice if you want a better behaved plant. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Next session. Um, what I'm calling throw down seed and walk away. The idea here is that you've got a big space, you're not really sure what to do with it, or maybe you're planting a sunny garden and you're thinking, geez, he's been talking about all these woody, you know, or not woody, shady ground covers. What do I do in my, you know, burgeoning meadow? This is um, a species that we have started using regularly now, um, specifically in our burgeoning meadows. This is Canicrista fasciculata. It's our native partridge pea, um, one of a couple different native partridge peas. This one's our personal favorite. This is a native annual species. Um, and what that means is that this is something that we use to fill spaces in quickly. We, we did up a new meadow um, over the past couple seasons, or really the past two in kind of masses. Um, and when, when we were thinking about doing this, we we're coming up with different ways to do the meadow. And, you know, there's a hundred different ways. Do you, do you plant plugs? Do you use two quarts? Do you throw down seed? You know, how do you deal with the weeds as they're first emerging and so forth? Um, 
And like these kind of woodland environments, the issue of weeds coming in when your good plants are starting to establish is a major concern. This is why we use mulch, is to cover these kind of weedy areas. We decided instead of mulching the meadow, which doesn't make a lot of sense, we were simply going to sow this plant in between every plug, every, every other seed we've sown, everything. This plant got sowed heavily. In fact, it covered the entire space. Um, and that season, we had this plant growing everywhere. Um, the entire area was filled with Camacrista. It covered, you know, the entire spot without letting anything else come up, you know, with any vigor. So it covered the space for us quite nicely. We let it go to bloom, um, and then we decided to get in there and start cutting it back before it sets seed in certain areas. And what we're doing is we're going around and looking at the little little blue stems that we planted, and the baptisias that we planted, and the milkweeds we planted, and the mountain mints, and all these others. And in between all these annuals, those plants were getting established. They were small, they weren't growing very quickly, especially with the shade of this one, but they were starting to get filled in. So the ones that we found were more kind of robust, we really cut this plant back heavily to let them really start taking off. In other areas where they weren't moving quite as quickly, we left a little bit more of this in place to allow its seed to drop. And we used this to pretty much just fill in everything. It complete gave us this great cover. Pretty much the first two, two seasons was heavily Camicrista. Um, after that, it started dissipating as these kind of long-lived perennials started to really fill in and take the place. It's very good at filling in empty areas. It's not very good at competing once you've got other species starting to fill in. So it's pretty much your young meadow species. And you see that you get this kind of transition period where it starts dissipating as these kind of short-lived perennials start filling in. Things like Lobelia, things like Rudbeckia, like Monarda punctata, we'll get to those in just a second. And they're kind of the next stage of the process. So the first two seasons is this native annual. Then you get these kind of short-lived perennials that seed and grow quite quickly. Um, think about it, you know, plant a lupin next to a little blue stem, um, and the, sorry, not a lupin, sorry, a lobelia next to a little blue stem, and you know, start your top watch, your lobelia is up and blooming within a season, and you know, is blooming every year afterwards, right, you know, regularly. That little blue stem, First year, it's put on some size. Second year, it's starting to look pretty good. Third year, it's coming into its own. After the fourth or fifth year, you've got, you know, a nice size little blue stem. Lobelia is already on its third generation at that point. You've got these different rates of growth, and you want to work with that. So first couple seasons, annuals. Second season, we're looking at Monarda punctata and the Rudbeckia herda that we'll get to next. I think people know bee bombs quite well. They tend to know Monarda didyma, the scarlet bee bomb. Um, Monarda fistulosa, I find, is a little less well known, but it's still pretty well known. That's the one we call wild bergamot. I find this one is much less commonly used. This is Monarda punctata, the spotted bee bomb. And I think the reason it's less commonly used is because it is a short-lived perennial, and people don't tend to like plants that don't last very long. That being said, if you plant one of these in the right area, it'll be in the same spot for a good 50 years. Um, the thing is that the, the plant you planted probably died two years after you planted it, and then 50 years later, you're looking at the 20th generation of the first one you planted. These short-lived plants survive in the wild long-term because they're able to drop their seed, and that seed is able to grow and kind of continue moving in a space. And this is important to know, because if you go through the typical kind of fall cleanup and cut these, you know, seed heads off, you're lucky to see this plant for two years, maybe three. If you do what we do at the garden, simply let the seed drop, it will continue growing any time when there's open space for it. Um, and like the Camacrista, it'll eventually kind of give way as the you know, long-lived perennials start filling in. And that's okay. Um, the idea of planting a plant knowing it's not going to last long, but knowing it's a part of the process is something to kind of wrap our heads around. We plant Camacrista knowing that in two years, it's gonna be gone. We plant this one knowing that in four years, it's gonna be gone. And when it's gone, all that little blue stem has really come into its own now. And the baptisias are coming in nicely. Um, and we've got our mountain mints and our joe pie weeds and all those other plants that are the long-lived perennials. This is also a pollinator magnet. Um, you know, you see bumblebees here. This is a goldenrod crab spider, the flower longhorn beetle, these great um, digger wasps, the great golden and the great black digger wasp. Um, both of which look really mean, but um, when I was taking these pictures, I was literally poking them with my finger, and they didn't mind at all. They were much more interested in the food than they were in my finger. And this is the plant second year after planting. We planted it the first year, put in a couple of small plugs. They were kind of funny looking, didn't really do much. Um, we didn't cut it back. We have a rule at Garden in the Woods. Don't cut back anything unless you've got a good reason to. 
Um, if you're trying to stop the spreading of a plant, you know, reducing, um, you know, nutrients in an area, you've got disease problems, you know, those are good reasons to. But if you don't have a reason, just leave it up. Um, that seed is good bird seed. It's, it's the future of plants. And in this case, this was year number two for us. Um, first year looked okay. Second year, this was incredible. Um, masses of this plant doing very, very well. And now five years later, there's not all that much of it left. It's just on the edges or areas where other plants are doing poorly um, and everything else is filled in in place of it. At the same time as the Monarch Punctata, we planted Rudbeckia herda. This is the biennial Rudbeckia. Um, this is the, the Black-Eyed Susan, not Rudbeckia fulgida, which I think is probably more commonly used. Fulgida is more of a true perennial, whereas this one is a short-lived perennial or a biennial species. And because of that, you get a lot of mixing of seed. The cool thing about that mixing of seed is with the mixing of seed, you get a mix of different genetics coming in. You see a lot of variations. So you see these solid yellow forms. You see these kind of orange colored forms. You see some that are almost solidly orange, which is definitely the exception that makes the rule. But quite nice when you see it. Um, the cool thing about these plants where you get a lot of seed variation going on is you see so much differences. You see short ones and tall ones, and you see glossy ones and matte ones and orange ones and yellow ones. Um, there's something to be said for the consistency of working with cloned plants. There's something also to be said for the inconsistency that you come when you're working with seed grown plants. Um, you find variation, wonderful variation, and sometimes you find great things that you want to kind of continue growing afterwards. Another very easy one as far as kind of creating more plants. This is that same garden. This is our coastal sand plain garden. And I just go there in spring looking for this uh, little Rudbeckia seedlings, the, the, the hort guys. Um, you know, when this plant gets too rambunctious, they're happy I come in. I'm, I'm weeding for them. These weeds get dug up. They get taken into the greenhouse with me. They get thrown into a pot. Um, and if within a matter of, uh, you know, a couple of weeks to a month or two, you've got a pot ready to go, which I thought I had a picture of and apparently forgot to take. Um, but just imagine right now, a nice big pot full of this stuff, looking great, because that's that's where it comes from. All right, last section of this class, we got a couple minutes left, and I want to kind of get through these before we call it a day, um, is the idea of these woody covers. Um, what we've got here are species that are not herbaceous anymore and are most certainly not ground covers. This is talking about now just good covering space instead of really trying to stay low. Um, Sumac is one of my absolute favorite genera in New England, and there's a variety of different species that have a variety of different uses. This is probably the one I recommend most regularly when I'm talking to gardeners, landscapers, um, various different folks, because I find it's the most well-behaved. Um, and well-behaved is good when it comes to sumac, because they can be very rambunctious, and you don't necessarily want a very rambunctious in every single spot. Um, plant staghorn sumac in front of that delicate little kind of, you know, meadow garden, and you're going to quickly have a meadow full of staghorn sumac and not much of a meadow left. Um, that being said, Rus aromatica is quite well behaved. It can handle a bit of shade, not dense shade, but part sun to part shade is not a problem. Um, it can also handle full sun, dry soils, salt spray, pollution, parking lot island troubles, um, and do it quite well. Um, this picture was taken over at the Cambridge Water Department, um, right by a fresh pond. Um, this is a big mass of um, fragrant sumac, and I love to point out the fact that that tree in the middle is completely dead, did not make it, and the staghorn sumac is not batting an eye. Um, it is literally run over at times. It gets dumped on by, like, all sorts of, you know, kind of road problems, and it does just fine. Um, very, very workable plant. In this case, we're looking at the cultivar Grolo on the left. Um, on the right, you can see a little bit of a taller one. That's the natural species. They both give you great colors in the fall. Rus copalinum is my happy middle ground. Um, this one is more rambunctious than Rus aromatica, but less rambunctious than Rus typhina, the staghorn sumac that I think is the most common one in New England. Um, this one is rambunctious enough where it is less usable in the landscape than aromatica, but at the same time, I find it quite useful for um, for roadside situations, for parking lot islands, for abandoned sites. This is one that most certainly can be used in urban settings. Um, you know, think about those concrete pits where trees pretty much go to die. Um, think about that one out front that just the tree goes in five years later, it's dead. You wait another five years of dead tree before the DOT folks come around, tear it out, plant the next tree in. Um, those are the sorts of areas we should start thinking to plant these sorts of plants. Um, Rus copalinum is well behaved enough where it can work in those settings that aren't that complete and utter concrete pit, um, but you want something a little bit more rambunctious. When you've got the real concrete pit or you've really just given up and you just want something to cover it, that's where you can start looking towards staghorn sumac. 
Um, I absolutely love this species in fall. The colors on it are phenomenal. Why anyone would ever plant a burning bush when you could plant a staghorn sumac is beyond me. Um, the fruits are also really quite tasty, and this is a fabulous pollinator plant. Um, that being said, know what you're getting into. This is a vigorous species. It will push through sites. Um, it's great for that parking lot island. It's great for that concrete pit where it's not going anywhere. This is a pretty tough one to work into your typical garden settings. Um, know what you're getting into. A wonderful species in the right area and a weed in areas where you don't want it. Last one that I want to talk about in the woody section is this Rubus odoratus. Um, there are a variety of different Rubus in New England. This is, um, they're great, great species. I love Rubus. They're fabulous for pollinators. They taste great. They got a lot to offer. Um, that being said, I mostly think of the Rubus genera as edible species, not really as ornamentals. This one is the one that can most certainly fall into the ornamental range as well as an edible. As you can see from the picture, it does produce an edible berry. It's not the tastiest raspberry, but it's by no means bad tasting. It tastes quite nice, but the other ones are better. I think red raspberry, blackberry, black raspberry are really the best. But this one's still sweet and quite nice. The nice thing about this one, though, is it produces a big um, purple flower with a big, broad, robust, large leaf, and the stems are covered in dense hairs and no thorns. Um, it's also better behaved than any of the other rubus. It's still a rubus. It's still got a caning growth to it, and it's going to want to kind of fill an area in, but it doesn't grow quite as vigorously as, say, the red raspberry or some of these others. Um, much more usable in, in your typical kind of settings that you don't want a real voracious spreader in. This one's a strong grower, but not a overly strong grower. Makes a great living wall. Um, Right here, you could see it used as a living wall. In fact, what you don't see behind it is a dilapidated stone wall because this has pretty much covered the space. And we'll come in here every now and then and tear out any stems that are starting to move too far forward. And every couple of years, we go in and we give it a haircut because we get a lot more flowering and fruit production when it's growing on younger stems. Um, but this is a very good low maintenance option for an area where you just want a kind of wall um, to be covered in. Um, and it's slow enough where it works without taking over the area. This is a species that really should be used much more often. It's also um, quite shade tolerant. I wouldn't put it on the shade species list, but part shade's not a problem. I see this growing on wooded roadside somewhat regularly. All right, one more plant, and then I'm going to call us a, a day. We got two minutes left, and I'll finish this off on time. This is Xanthorhiza simplissima, the yellow root. Um, produces a flower that I'd find more interesting than necessarily very showy. I think it's pretty cool, but um, I'm not jumping up and down about the flowers. They don't last very long, and they're pretty small. Um, what is really great about this one is the texture of the plant. Um, there's a great patch of this stuff in the Arnold Arboretum that has been there for as long as I know for years. Um, and every now and then people run it over and it just kind of keeps coming back for more. Um, good textural foliage, really nice fall colors on it, especially when given good sun. But even in the shade, you get some good color on this one. Um, with that in mind, I just want to kind of, you know, pull it all together here. We have this thing where we think of mulch as a permanent aspect in the garden. I've got a rule that I've been living by for a while now, and it's worked out quite nicely for me. If you've got a garden that's more than five years old and you still have mulch in it, it's time to plant more plants. Mulch is not a permanent part of the garden. It's a good tool for young spaces. And when you start thinking about it on a more temporary basis, you can kind of start switching from finding a product that'll last as long as possible so you don't have to keep applying it to something that'll break down quickly and improve the soil as it does. Um, mulch should break down. In fact, we use a lot of leaves for mulch at Garden in the Woods because we want them to break down. We want them to build good soil. Um, and as they break down and build good soil, instead of having mulch in place, we've got plants. And that's really what it's all about. Another thing that we find quite regularly when we talk to landscapers is they've got a new spot, they, you know, a new client, a new area. They've got new spots and they don't know what to do with it. Think about cover crops as a good way of holding place. Um, you know, you've got a client that says, hey, I don't know what to do over here. Throw down a whole bunch of that can of Krista. Throw down some, some of the, the biennial rubecchias. Throw down that Monarda punctata. Throw down, you know, kind of quick growing species like Liatris, um, Lobelia. Sorry, not Liatris, Lobelia. That's, that's the fast growing one. And this is a good way of kind of holding a space. Um, and looking great while you do it. I mean, you've got these masses of flowers. The area is covered. The pollinators are loving it. It gives you an entire season to figure out what to do with the area. There's a good chance your client's going to fall in love with what you did with the area and say, I actually just want to keep it that way. Think about using plants in larger numbers but at smaller sizes. Forget the two quarts and the one gallons and the big plants. Save that for the woody stuff. Plant in plugs. This picture shows it nicely. Lots of small plants that you pay a lot less for needed much closer together. 
Um, forget the whole 18 inch spacing thing. Look at eight inch spacing, look at six inch spacing, look at putting things right on top of each other so that the whole area gets covered and filled in. Um, the idea that plants can't touch each other and 18 inches of red mulch in between all of them is a stupid idea, it needs to go away. Um, I want plants filling in everywhere. I don't wanna see soil. I want everything covered by, by various different, in many cases, ground covers. Um, it works well to kind of cover the whole area and then all your taller stuff in between become the specimens amongst the flux in Tiarella Garden. My goal is to never see any soil. If you see soil, it's a great place for weed seeds to land, for weeds to get going, for problems to occur. Um, I want plants, not mulch. With that in mind, um, I'll mention that we've got a book coming out shortly. If anyone wants to learn more about this book, go to the New England Wildflower Society website. Um, you can pre-order it through our garden shop right now. We'll have it in hand March 1st. We'll talk a lot more about these things that I covered today in, in much more depth than I can do in a one hour lecture. Um, and for at least the next 12 seconds, it's actually cheaper to buy it through us than it is through Amazon. And we get all the proceeds, which a starving nonprofit could really use. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to start paying attention to our questions now and answer everything that I possibly can. Hey, Dan, thank you. Thanks very uh, right. much. So for anyone who's got to get out of here, go right out. I've got a good couple questions started here, so I'm going to just jump right into them. Um, okay. What do you do to stop a grass edge of sometimes Bermuda grass from encroaching into a ground cover bed? This is a great question. Um, we get a lot of these kind of, especially when you've got, um, you know, your typical lawn moving into garden beds or Bermuda grass or anything else. Um, we tend to fight fire with fire. If we've got a plant like Bermuda grass, or you name the weed that keeps pushing into our bed, um, you've got two options. You either weed it regularly, or you give it competition. Um, getting the, you know, keeping kind of mulch in place gives it a great place to start filling in. Mulch, as I said, is okay, you know, stopping weeds, but not great. Get weed, get plants into that plant. Get better weeds in its place. And by what I mean by that are native species that you actually want in place. Um, that look nice, that can become a part of the garden, but have enough vigor to push back against those grasses that you don't want moving into the place. Um, this works really well when we're talking about species, like if we're in the sunny spot, um, I use a lot of, actually it's funny here, it's one of the questions, any thoughts on Pacara aurea? That's one of the species that I use regularly to kind of work in sunny environments. Um, Pacara aurea or Pacara obaveda, depending on the conditions, work well to kind of form that, that barrier, that boundary to stop things from pushing in. Um, you can use a lot of these various species I talked about kind of as competition against other plants. Um, it's why I say I don't want to see any soil. I want plants filling in everything. They are competition against weeds. You know, imagine a weed seed landing in a full bed of plants. It doesn't have a very good chance of growing. Think about the same way when you've got weed problems, whether it be seed coming in or plants pushing. You want other plants pushing back. All right, ground cover to compete with invasives and withstand trampling by deer. Um, all right, so when we're talking about invasive species, I kind of get away from my nice delicate phlox and stoloniferas and I start looking at much more vigorous species. Um, so where I might not want something, you know, overly powerful in, in the garden settings, when we're talking about pushing against invasives, I start looking towards those plants. I start looking at hay scented fern because I'd rather have hay scented fern than Japanese stiltgrass. I start looking at plants like Matusia, the fiddlehead fern, if you got moist soils, can form a nice, thick, impenetrable barrier. Um, I start looking at plants like the staghorn sumac um, or other kind of woody covers, you know, a patch of rubus that can really fill. Volunteer led groups in the U.S. Um, the, those regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Midwest Ecological Landscape Alliance, and Eco Landscape California. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Um, Dan Jaffe is the propagator and stock bed grower for New England Wildflower Society, uh, headquartered at Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts. Dan has a degree in botany, an advanced certificate in native plant horticulture and design, many years of experience in horticulture, and a boundless enthusiasm for native plants. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Dan. Dan, welcome. All areas in. Um, I don't tend to think of staghorn sumac when I'm just looking to kind of compete with, you know, the, the grass seed coming in. When I'm pushing against invasives, I break out the big guns. Um, I'll take a weedy native any day over an invasive species. Um, and if you ever get to the point where that invasive is really truly gone, it'll be easier to remove the weedy native than it will to be removed the invasive and you could then move on to the next step. But I tend to think of it as a permanent solution. It may not make the invasive go away altogether, but the amount of work you'll have to do against that invasive is greatly reduced once you get the weedy native in there. 
All right. Um, I see a couple. Is this the same wild strawberry that I consider to be my weed garden lawn in Virginia? It most certainly is. Um, there's a chance of other strawberries. There are other strawberries out there. I don't know Virginia very well, but at least in New England, the wild strawberry I was talking about is a very, very common plant on the landscape. If you're out in, in most cases, lawns are a good way to actually look for it. If you see something that looks like a strawberry, tastes like a strawberry, grows like a strawberry, it's probably a strawberry. There's a couple lookalikes, Indian strawberries, a potentilla lookalike, the barren strawberry, but they're less common. The wild strawberry is pretty common. Um, and the, the fact that you consider it to be a weed makes a lot of sense. This is a vigorous growing plant. Um, it's why I recommend this spreading wild strawberry for a lawn replacement, but I won't put it in the list of, say, these other, you know, Phlox, Tirella, um, you know, Pacra as good kind of garden plants. Um, the wild strawberry is the lawn replacement. The woodland strawberry might be able to work its way into kind of garden settings, and various other ground covers do as well. What about the invasive nature of some of these plants? None of these plants are invasives. Everything I was talking about today are, are native species. Um, native species can never be invasive. They can be thuggish at times, and that's when I'd say, you know, get to know what the species is and what it's doing um, as far as the area that you want to plant it. Um, I wouldn't put wild strawberry in amongst other species because in that case, it's going to be weedy. Um, not invasive, but still, I'd rather not have the, the, you know, the wild strawberry taking over my delicate, say, trillium bed. Um, so decide where you want these. I like weeds when a weed is called for, um, a native weed in that case, you know, say against a, an invasive species or in place of a lawn. Um, but when it comes to, you know, a delicate garden, I don't want to be using some of these more vigorous species. So kind of decide which, you know, kind of which species is required in the spot that you're talking about. I like spread when I want spread and I want something well behaved where it's meant to be. Oh, what else do we got here? Um, thoughts on Pacarora, we covered that. Can you recommend something that grows in Vermont in shade and in sand? Um, that Canada Mayflower is a great one for you. It grows quite well in um, shady, sandy conditions. Um, for that matter, it's Big Brother. Myanthum rasmosum is another good option for you. Flux stolonifera can work quite well. Um, you'll want to help it get established, but once you get it established, it's good to go. Um, in Vermont, you can definitely get away with wintergreen. Um, Galtheria procumbens, it can be slow and difficult to get established, but it's a lot more easy to establish it in Vermont than it is in Massachusetts. Um, same story for bunchberry, which I don't tend to recommend for Massachusetts. It's a great plant, but it's definitely a plant of the north and doesn't do very well in, in the warmer summers that we get in Massachusetts. All right, other questions. Ground covers that can compete with invasives. Um, I think we already covered that. Can you recommend local sources for plugs? There's a good question. Um, well, not to sound too self-serving, but most certainly come to us, Garden in the Woods and Nisami Farm out in um, Waitley for um, good plug options. If you are a landscaper or a member of a group that can have a commercial account, you can go through um, North Creek Nurseries. They do some great plugs. Um, they ship. Um, they won't sell to individuals, but they will sell to landscaping companies and such. Um, other than that, let's see. Are any coming right to mind? You know, for good plug options, we need more good plug options. I can think of some more seed options, but those are the two that jump right into mind. Um, come to us. Go to North Creek Nurseries. I'm sure there's others out there that I'm blanking on, but my main is my mind's going blank at the moment. In terms of leaf mulch, I usually purchase it. I have a lot of Norway maple leaves that are covered with a nasty fungus. Can I use these as mulch? We mow over them. Okay, this is a great question. I've actually heard this a couple times recently. Um, so the running joke at Garden in the Woods is if you've got Norway maples with any side of tar spot whatsoever, the best thing to do is to cut the whole darn thing down and get rid of the invasive species. Um, that being said, for the realistic version of that answer, um, if you're not in a place where removing the native, you know, the, the tree is an option, um, you've got these leaves that are covered in tar spot. Um, tar spot is a, a pretty common disease of Norway maples, also affects our other maples, but Norway get it a lot more effect, you know, more regularly. Um, and if you keep that material in place, it is an inoculant to kind of get back up into the trees later um, the next season. If you can actually put those leaves through a composting process, I mean, pile them into the compost pile, let them go through the composting, allow them to, you know, kind of to really, we're looking for a compost pile where you can maintain it. Um, you're looking for probably about 130 degrees for two or three days. You've got a good option for, for killing off that disease, and then you can use it quite readily. Um, otherwise, what I'd say is use those leaves in places where the maples are not, uh, move them to a different part of the landscape, and pick other leaves, oaks, beaches, um, you know, various other things, and put those under the maple. So you're not putting the inoculant right under the maple tree. Um, 
on a small landscape, you know, moving it to, you know, the uh, a tenth of a, you know, kind of mile away, the inoculate is still going to be there. So you can use it and it's going to reinfect the trees, but I have trouble feeling bad for an invasive species, so I might not be the best person to ask the question of. All right, I got a couple thanks here. Do your weedy natives work against Japanese knotweed? Japanese knotweed is a tough one. I hate that darn invasive. I mean, I'm not a big fan of any invasives, but that one's particularly uh, difficult to work with. So there's no native species, no matter how weedy they are, that you can simply plant um, next to an invasive species and expect it to take over the invasive. Um, if they could do that, then they would be, you know, a native invasive if such a thing could ever exist, but instead it, it doesn't because there's checks and balances that stop them from being that vigorous. Um, what they can do, though, is make your job easier. Um, if you simply remove Japanese knotweed, it comes back. And if you keep removing it, it keeps coming back. And this is just, you know, this is the cycle you get into. If you start to work to remove these invasive species while also planting these very strong, powerful, weedy natives, then as you can get these natives established and start getting that competition in place, the amount of removal you'll have to do for that invasive species becomes much, much less. Um, now, this comes with a bit of a, a grain of salt. You need to kind of think through the process because if you've got a pure patch of Japanese knotweed, you've got options like solarizing, um, like sheet mulching, and if you're into Roundup, like spraying it with Roundup. Um, once you start getting the native species into that patch, then all of a sudden you've got, you know, you've got good stuff and bad stuff, and now it becomes a lot more difficult. Um, so what I always recommend doing is start by tackling the invasives kind of whole hog. Um, when possible, I really like solarizing. It's difficult to do with Japanese Nawi, but it is doable as long as you can keep on top of it. Do your best to remove the plants as much as is possible, knowing that you're never gonna get them completely out and there will still be a seed bank. Once you've really got them knocked down, then you go in there and start planting these weedy invasives. And it's the next couple of years that are the really important point. Um, you're gonna get in there working around the natives, working against the invasives and kind of do it piecemeal. Um, but if you can kind of keep on top of it for a couple of seasons, you can get the upper hand. And then at that point, the natives really start helping to keep the invasives from coming back in. Um, what do you think about the no mow lawn fescue mixes? Okay, this is a, that's a great question. I should have thought to throw that into this lecture in the first place. Um, there's a variety of they, these out there on um, these days. Um, I know, hey, this is great. People are recommending New Moon. Great choice for, um, for other plugs. New Moon is a, a fabulous nursery, so put that one on your list. They also, if I remember correctly, offer a lawn alternative mix. I know that uh, Wildflower Farm up in Toronto, um, Miriam Goldberg's group, they do a, I think they call it, I think they call it Eco Lawn or Eco Grass. I think one group does one, one group does the other. There's a couple different groups that are offering these kind of no low or, or low mo lawn fescue mixes. They're a mixture of native and non-native species. Um, there's usually clover mixed in there, a bunch of different grass species. They'll never be as valuable from a pollinator point of view as a true native lawn will be or, or a mixed native lawn. That being said, they are a much, much better option than your typical Kentucky bluegrass option. They're a very good middle ground. Um, there's something that can be where you can kind of clear an area, throw down seed and get them established, which is something you cannot do with our native carrots, Pennsylvania. I wish I could say you can, but it doesn't grow very well from seed. You do need to plant plugs for that one. Um, our wild strawberries, you can throw down seed, it works okay. Planting plants is better and they fill in quickly, but if you wanna be able to just chuck down seed, those low malt mixes or the, the, the mixed kind of no maintenance lawns or whatever they're calling them are a pretty darn good you know, middle ground. They're better for pollinators than Kentucky bluegrass. They're not as good as natives, but they have a great, they definitely have value and should be used. Okay, I think Virginia, you get Indian strawberry and it's an invasive that is difficult to get rid of. Um, I wish I knew Virginia better. Um, and this might be a, a, um, a question of common names and those common names definitely vary from, you know, in region. Um, the, the native kind of wild strawberry that I've mentioned a couple of times, I've heard described as invasive just by people who don't like how quickly it spreads. And it most certainly spreads, as I've said a number of times here, um, though not as an invasive species. Um, there are invasive species, obviously, that we want to get rid of, and I would never, ever recommend planting any invasive species, no matter where you are. Uh, I got one more question here. How do we get rid of buckthorn? Um, buckthorn is most certainly a difficult one to get rid of. Um, it really depends on your situation. Um, I, you know, if it's small, then pulling them out by hand is somewhat doable. If you've got just an, a starting, you know, patch, you can kind of get them out by hand. If they're big, but not too many of them, um, the weed wrench is a great option. 
If you've got an entire landscape of buckthorn, then trying to pull them out by hand becomes a lot more difficult. Um, I'm not a big fan of herbicides, and whenever possible, I will always avoid spraying. Um, but I have seen sites where physical removal was not an option. They went in there and did a cut and paint um, routine. I like paint a lot more than spraying. It's much easier to stop this from spreading into the landscape. But, but you know, the, the Roundup is a tricky issue. We don't really know as much about it as we used to. That being said, I'm not against it as much as I'm not for it. Um, I prefer to avoid it when possible, but if you've got someone who can take a site that's invaded with buckthorn and with a close, you know, um, paid attention to paint option can go from invaded to clean to eventually replanted with natives, I think there's a middle ground that we need to talk about. Um, whenever possible, I prefer physical removal. I love the idea of solarizing. I love the idea of sheet mulching. They should always be your first option. I think of um, pesticides or herbicides in this case as my final option. And in many cases, I look at them and say, nope, not here. Um, but that's a decision you need to make yourself. I think we need to have at least open options. Thank you for listening in, for bearing with me. You all have a wonderful night. It's been a pleasure.